who have been through this many times, and some of you have never been through it. So um, what we do is uh, we'll introduce ourselves, and then we're just going to open it up. This is your day to tell us what, what you're thinking about, what you're concerned about, what you would like us to be addressing. Um, issues that we have. Sometimes there are more contentious issues that we have that affect municipalities and sometimes not. And um, for those of us who were at the um, lunch, I think both Mara's um, talk about what municipalities do and are capable of and um, Mayor Weinberger um, talked about the um, what a couple very specific issues around the municipality. We have the chair here. Um, that's Allison's stool. Don't take I would never say that. No, don't take her stool. And um, I will apologize. One of our committee members, Brian, the Senator Palmer from Rutland, is right now at another committee presenting a bill. So he will be up there as soon as he's um, so I'm Jeanette White, and I chair Senate Government Operations. I represent Liberty mm -hmm. County. I am Sarah Copeland Hansis. I chair House Government Operations, and I represent uh, Fairly West Fairly and Breath. I'm Anthony Plano, Vice Chair of Senate Government Operations. I represent Washington County. Uh, my name is Chris Bray. I also serve on Government Operations on the Senate side, and I as I'm representative of the Carter Foundation, and I serve on the House Government Office. I'm Bob Christian Brown from Bob Carter. Uh, I thought it was interesting that 
here, Representative Marwicki, say you're, you're each other's constituents uh, with you and the senator. And, um, that's actually you know, part of the underlying um, intention of this um, proposed S-106 is um, the understanding that your constituents are our constituents. And we serve the same people. We serve a subset of those, but we serve them you know, day in and day out, week in and week out, week out throughout the year, um, addressing a variety of local needs. And uh, we think that those local needs um, need more, um, the, the local officials need a little more um, room to have some creativity and uh, be effective in addressing needs that are local as opposed to statewide. So um, there are others that will have something to say about that today. And we'd really like the opportunity, please, to sit down with you and go through more um, substantively um, what's in the proposed legislation and why it's important and why we think it serves not just individual community interests, um, but a broader state interest as well. Um, and one quick separate thing um, is on, on the um, same theme of local authority. Um, we appreciate that House Gov's op Gov Ops has um, stood up for 2% um, local option uh, tax on the marijuana legislation, and we hope, or cannabis uh, legislation, and we hope that as that um, continues on to final passage, that you'll stand behind that position. We understand that not all your colleagues uh, feel the same way. We think that it's very important um, the bulk of the revenue will come to the state coffers. I think it's really important that that 2% local option be available um, to municipalities. Thank you. So I would love to just take a minute to uh, to update folks on what's happening with the cannabis bill because um, it has made its way through the uh, Ways and Means Committee uh, that has worked on the tax uh, for the cannabis legislation. It's now waiting in uh, House Appropriations and then we'll come to the floor, we expect, um, as early as next week. Um, <clears throat> so our committee did, uh, did very deliberately leave in um, the proposal that there would be a 2% uh, local option for revenue to the municipalities, just in recognition that um, there, you know, there may be, there may be impacts to municipalities uh, with a new industry that is coming out of the shadows, shall we say, and into uh, into legal existence. Um, and so the House Ways and Means Committee did not agree that a two percent option on sales, which would be just you know two percent of whatever the the price uh, is that folks are paying for cannabis, was the right way to go. They have instead shifted um, to a, a model where the, the local cannabis um, commissions, and as you have local liquor commissions, you could have a local cannabis uh, commission as well, and that that local commission could assess um, a fee on the licensee for any kind of cannabis license. And so we actually think when you compare the two um, possible ways of getting revenue to municipalities, that the fee on all of the licensees that exist in your community might actually be um, a, a better gauge of what the impact could be. You could have two growers, or you could have 20 growers. You could have one retail and no growers, or you could have you know, any different combination of, of uh, cannabis licensees, and that having a having a cut of those fees uh, coming right back to the municipality would be um, a better way to make sure that uh, the, the impact to municipalities is um, is recognized. Um, we don't expect it's going to be a lot of revenue on the sales side, and. So that's why we think that maybe this um, this format of doing it through uh, through a fee would be uh, would be preferable. John, is there anything that I missed on that, or anything you'd like to clarify? Just so I can clarify, is the local option tax will only be collected at the retail site. So towns who had a grower, um, a manufacturer, or a wholesaler wouldn't get any option tax as the bill is currently drafted. With this thing. Anyone who has a licensee, whether it's a cultivator or a manufacturer, wholesaler, or any grade licensee or a retailer, will, will get some of that licensing fee. So this is shares around the, the, the revenue a little more um, than the local option tax would. Just in 
Muscle with the Vice Chair of the Select Board. Um, I just want to follow up to see if there's any kind of idea of numbers around that because, for instance, the, the fees we charge for alcohol sales and things like that are, are minimal, comically small. So I'm just wondering if that, are we talking hefty fees and it's to be shared with the state, like similar to the way that we, our town courts collect, you know, the same fee that people who want to sell alcohol have to pay yearly. We're talking 50 to $100, something like that. So I think the only way to gauge that, because the, the Cannabis Control Board at the state level won't come into existence until after this bill passes, and then they will determine what they think the licensing fee should be for the, for the, for, for the different tiers, you know, small, medium, and large, as well as for the different kinds of licenses that John listed. Uh, but but you, could, you could make an assumption that, that those fees might be in line with what other states who have created tax and regulate models might be, although I don't know that other states have done the tiered licensing that we're looking at. Um, but, but perhaps the, the largest um, uh, license type might be roughly equivalent to what, say, Massachusetts or uh, or Oregon or California do. Uh, it's really hard to say. John, any, any other insights that you have from sitting in with the Ways and Means Committee on that? No, because, well, that part didn't come up when they uh, were discussing the bill. That was the amendment that they voted out just yesterday. Um, so yeah. I don't know much more than that. And I will say that from the Senate's perspective, um, it's the whole thing will be up for a conference committee. I, I can guarantee that. Um, and I, I don't know that we would, I know that I went to, um, was at a store in Brattleboro last weekend, and um, it's called the Hempicure, no, it's something, hemp something. And they have turned, he, the kid that works there has no, no vested interest in what, they might generate in terms of sales because he's, he's an employee, he's not an owner. And he said that every single day and every weekend day, he probably turns down $4,000 in sales if they could sell. So a 2% local options tax on that would be significantly more than anything you could put on a, a, an additional fee in addition to what the state is putting on as a fee. So anyway, that, that, that isn't, there's a difference of opinion there, and how it shakes out is anybody's guess. And I, I, I just want to point out, I, must, I, I, just, I don't want to take up the whole time here, but I just want to point out that all those other states that people point to, Colorado, Illinois, Massachusetts, they all have local government uh, sales tax add-ons to their provision. So. And not. Well, I don't know about the fees, so that's another question, but um, I do know they have healthy yeah. local taxes being applied to cannabis sales. Liz? Thank you, Jeanette. I'm Liz McLaughlin from Bradford. It, it, we have a very nice example with liquor sales because, yes, we have liquor licenses, but then we also have rooms and meals tax, and much more revenue is raised from the room and meals tax. Than <coughs> Liquor licenses are pittance. Uh, Christine Mott, Mayor of Winooski. Um, I think additional to that, why wouldn't we want to see parity amongst the way that these two local governing bodies occur? We are already running a liquor control board. Shouldn't cannabis be treated in a similar fashion? Um, and I think there's also some alignment between this issue and the um, local government that we know on the ground what is good for our communities. We would like to see some of this funding, so, like from local options tax, so that we can implement program for prevention with the youth in our uh, communities. We've seen that as an evidence-based model of prevention. The more connected that youth feel to their community, the less likely they are to engage in substance abuse. The more agency that we have to find out what are the ways to make our youth feel connected, I think there's better prevention there than waiting on a state level to do that for us. Pretty quiet group today. Yes. Um, my name is Jesse Baker. I'm the city manager of Winooski. I'm, I'm here, obviously, with my mayor, Mayor Locke, but also with uh, my
my city councilor, Hal Colston, here, are also my state rep. Um, I wanted to, I'm, I'm going to forego the uh, comment on the marijuana marketplace. I think the mayor spoke very appropriately for our community. But I would like to go back to what my colleague from Brattleboro brought up about S106 and encourage the House to take up that legislation and, and really consider this being uh, the biennium where we do something innovative and progressive about local control. You know, Vermont's always been a statewide culture of innovation, local control, and gumption. This would allow us the opportunity to have a true experiment in a time delineated fashion to look at what giving your shared ele local elected officials slightly more power to dictate how local communities are governed would lead to innovation in the state and lead to unique communities meeting their um, needs in different ways. Um, I really encourage the House to take up that um, to take up that bill, hold hearings, as my colleague Peter said. We welcome the opportunity to come back and talk to you about that more in depth. Um, if it, and I also want to thank the Senate for initially moving it forward in the first year. It was a huge step in the right direction, and really, I think for those of us who just love the municipal level and are and are many people in the room have talk, heard me talk about what a, what a dork, dork I am for local government, but a real. Um, a real um, acknowledgement of what we're trying to do on the local level to be creative. So thank you for that, and, and please take it up. Um, with the uh, committee's blessings, I'd actually like to turn it back to Mayor Lott. She has a um, really interesting example in, from her experience in governance at the local level of how in this kind of self-governance innovation could have improved um, our community in Winooski in the last year. With, with the blessing of the chair. Before we do that, can I just give an example that we, um, when we were doing the um, S-106, about four years ago, um, the town of Woodstock, they had some parking meter money, and they wanted to use their parking meter money for something else other than more parking meters, and they weren't allowed to do that because we told them they had to use parking meter money for parking meters. So if it did, we actually did something which allowed them to use the money for it. But that was an example of something so, so sillily minute that we had to weigh in on that to allow a local government to do what they felt was best. So anyway, I just needed to, because I think that was what, one of the most insane samples I've seen. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> so a similar example, um, when I ran for mayor actually last winter, I was in the middle of a two-year term on the city council, and by our charter, I actually had to step down in order to run for mayor. I was running against another sitting councilor whose term was actually ending, so he was able to fulfill his term and then run for the position of mayor. Um, it creates some disconnect I, when I ended up winning. I had been then not serving for six weeks, maybe more, 12. Um, so there's a, a disconnect in, in service there. There's also a bit of an imbalance when you know you have two parties running, one is still sitting at the table visibly and, and in the decision-making process. You know, there were executive sessions, there were important negotiations happening that then I had to be caught up to speed on when I came back into my seat as the mayor. And this is another example of something that is a small administrative issue that would benefit our community to have more continuity in local leadership and to have to elevate that through the process all the way here for you folks to make that decision doesn't seem like a good use of time and inhibits the ability of us to, you know, respond to an issue like that. Fairly, and I also want to speak to that to that bill because we experienced it with a population of 670 people. There's not a lot of folks out there who can take on particularly that treasurer's role, and the role has become so complex now. You can't just pick somebody out of the air and say you'll learn it. Um, we needed a charter change when our our treasurer and town clerk retired. We split the jobs. Better. Um, keeping those jobs separate anyways. But the delay that happened in terms of trying to get through that, you know, a local vote, fine. But beyond that, uh, you know, getting that approval and truly having 
the select board chair, be the assistant treasurer working with Nemrick, a contractor coming in, but the need for someone in town who understood our books and our budget and all of that stuff had to be doing that stuff on the ground. They came in, paid bills, that sort of thing, but that delay was just about broke us, um, just in terms of that sort of workload. It needs to move along more quickly, wasn't anything strange. We needed to have qualified treasurer serving our town. Thank you. Thank you. I would add one more small thought. I would rather have you folks spending your time on bigger issues that we can't address in our community. Bit of a change. First of all, um, I'm Jeff Weinberg from Rutland, um, uh, Public Works Commissioner, and I totally support and have for decades um, all the sentiments that you've just heard from the, my peers here. Um, on another issue, um, House 782, and there's a Senate uh, correlation. Senate's actually taking the lead on it. It's, it, it's, yeah. what, what is it? It's the Omnibus Housing Bill? Yes. Um, there, are, it, it's, there are a lot of moving parts in there. Uh, and I think uh, the mayor of Burlington did an excellent job uh, at lunch today uh, in terms of advocating for um, the uh, uh, Active 50 exemption for uh, designated downtowns, um, which I you know, wholeheartedly endorse as well. I'd like to talk about a different feature in the bill, and that is the exemption of uh, for municipal wage, wastewater and water connection permits from state permitting. Um, I also formerly served as uh, commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation, and that's where that permitting takes place. So I've kind of had an opportunity to see this activity, this program from both sides. And um, honestly, uh, if, if a community has a water and wastewater utility, and they choose not to um, uh, regulate and permit new connections, then absolutely the state should do that. They, if, a, if a community is not interested in doing that, I don't know how many that would be, but um, certainly the state, somebody needs to do that. There's no question about that. But in, in my experience, the vast majority of cases, it's just duplicative. The, the local uh, utility, the municipality, um, regulates and permits all new or expanded connections to their uh, water and wastewater system. And the state also regulates and permits those connections. And I am at a loss to see in those circumstances where there already is that program, that permitting, that regulation at the local level, what public benefit at all is derived from the state duplicating that. This is precisely why it's a development plan. I believe it has support. Duplicative outwork is not what any of us are interested in. Absolutely. And I would. But this is not the sad of the jurisdiction of these committees. It is, but when we can chat afterwards. And we, send the, I'm Vice Chair of Senate Economic Development. I would, we would love to have your testimony if you'd submit it. I would be happy to do that. Right. Um, your support of those sections would be great. Okay. Excellent. But as the municipal, um, the committee that deals with sure. municipal issues, we could actually make a recommendation oh. to mm -hmm. to the economic development committee. Oh, that's great. The more support we can get for those sections, the better. I, I, I would just to complete the thought. Um, I would just say that um, A and R regulates our system and they regulate our discharges that go to the waters of the state. They regulate our drinking water system, our withdrawals, and obviously any contaminants, you know, monitoring, testing, and all of that. We are subject to those permits. It is our responsibility to make sure that we comply with all of those regulations and those permits. We believe strongly that it is unnecessary for ANR to also regulate connections to those systems that they regulate. That should be our responsibility, um, and that's essentially my point. 
but I'd be happy to provide that to the committees of jurisdiction. I'm Herb Durfee, the town manager for the town of Norwich. Um, generally supportive of the 106 issues that you've spoken about, and again, trying to identify a particular model that we can work within. Um, I think the whole intent is really to cooperate and to collaborate with the legislature to figure things out, and exactly eloquently said by the news is to figure out, you know, free up, so to speak, time for you folks to be able to get to the bigger things and have us work out the very details of whatever those things are, just in that aspect of things. But I don't know, secondly, I don't know if it's the appropriate jurisdiction. We're a community that's been petitioned to have on our warrant this year, which it is the fair and impartial policing um, uh, policy-related language that actually matches Winooski. Um, and the concern that I have is that I'm a sworn officer of the community and I have sworn police officers. And as, you, as you've all heard, there are issues with regard to whether there's breakage of federal law in terms of stuff. Officers sworn to uphold the Constitution, not break the law and all that sort of stuff. I'm going to use the term, but I know you can't trump federal law. But um, is there something that we need to have in Vermont that would grant immunity to our police officers who are in those particular situations? Again, I don't know if this is jurisdictionally your particular committees, um, but I've raised the question with Vermont League of Cities and Towns in terms of, hey, if something does happen, does our insurance carrier cover an action by a police officer that may be considered to break federal law? I think it could be, it, it probably one of those issues that goes <coughs> in, uh, could be in either here or in judiciary and I don't know, you, do you have law enforcement in your committee? We, we are, um, our committee has jurisdiction over law enforcement. So the, and I also sit on judiciary. So it, it's, it could be in either one and we're actually dealing with it in both. So, <coughs> I don't know, do you, do you have law enforcement uh, in your committee? We do, we do, but it, it, this feels like it could be something that sort of bridges the two yeah. committees. Right. And I'm not, I'm not sure something's gonna get, I know we're real close to crossover, it's the funny year, all that sort of stuff, but just, I am concerned about, you know, a police officer, their job is rooted in integrity. Mm -hmm. And it's hard if something comes out, and I know that Vermont at this point is protective of individuals across the state, especially as the case precedent is starting to come out. But I do think that it may be important to at least examine the side of things with regard to insurance coverage and at least immunity of those officers. We have a kind of a, we call it the general law enforcement bill that we've had hanging around for a number of years, we keep resurrecting it. And adding things to it, taking things away from it, that this might be something that we can talk to Karen about um, maybe putting it in 124? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Anybody else? Here's what's I have What's your name? Uh, Lucas Herring, Mayor for the City of Barrie. Um, you, you talk about other bills in other areas. That's not your jurisdiction currently, but a SO 106 would actually affect a lot of those bills that do come forward because they're in that committee rather than something that we could have addressed ourselves. Uh, last year, for example, we put forward a charter change approved by our uh, constituents uh, in order to uh, beef up our housing board of review. Uh, evictions are a big thing, uh, it's a hot topic, not one that we see much in the legislature, uh, but one that we were hoping that our local housing board of review could have handled. The voters did put it forward. Um, it went to a committee uh, at the House and they said it was too broad, too overreaching. Uh, so they carved back the power of what we were looking to do. So as it was passed, um, that board still didn't really have the authority to do what they wanted to. This town meeting day, we actually have a charter change provision up there to just eliminate it altogether. If, if that body can't function the way that we need it to, then what's the point of having it? So I just want you to realize too that um, we are trying to take some of that on, but sometimes we're then shackled 
So uh, take that into consideration. It's not just what this body, what this group does, but it also affects the other committees and some of the decisions that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Is there anybody in here who actually opposes S-106? No? You know, and the way it's structured is, I don't know how many different towns are here right now today in this room, but there's probably more than 10. And the way the bill is structured, I think it is a, it would, is a pilot because it would deal with 10 communities. Isn't it? I think it's 10. Up right? to 10, right. Up to 10. So even if every community in the state agreed with it, it might not be applicable to them in the first round because it's, but I, it's, I just was curious if anybody actually opposed it. I think what's important is that it, it's the opportunity to um, put some examples out there of how this could work well and how it could benefit other communities in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. Senator White, to that point, uh, Bill Fraser, senior, uh, senior manager, I wasn't going to speak, but you, you posed that question. And I think the, the idea of 10 pilot, a uh, 10 town pilot was put forth um, recognizing that you folks are reluctant to provide the authority to the communities. I don't think that the municipalities of own would put a limit on. Right. We would all like to take advantage of that. So if you see fit to widen that scope, <laughs> so, you know, funny, but I, I mean it. You know, I, I think it, there's some meaningful reform here. So um, we, I, I am sure we would be for it, but we are willing to try it on a pilot basis so that it, to, to the, the risk that you all perceive might exist we're willing to put a box around it and, and see how it looks, but we, I don't think on our side of the table we think that's necessary. Some of us see it less risky than others. And less risk, risk of giving you the authority to do it. So I mean. Yeah, we know that Allison just said we're often reluctant to give up power, and that is. We had this conversation, though, you and I beforehand about the, uh, we should put a little plug in here for everybody to read Vermont papers if you haven't read it, um, and about how governments in the 21st century could actually work and be better. If you haven't read it, it's a great read. It's by Frank Bryan and John Lowry, and it isn't very often that I probably agree with John Lowry, but in this case, they are right on. He's still leaving. <laughs> Any other issues that you want to bring up that we are bills that we are dealing with or not dealing with or issues that we should? We don't have any elections things this year, I don't believe. Oh, yes, you do. You do have yeah. elections, though. We have non citizens voting. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a charter change. That's not a, a general bill. I meant for a general. You have an election bill mm -hmm. for campaign. Yes, you sent it to us. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. But I don't think we're changing this year any elections. Um, routines or we try not to do that all the time to drive the top part. It's really crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we do that in not so. <laughs> well, Any um, issues that are concerning you or I mean, I mean we're just always curious on regional law enforcement ideas or regional public safety issues or or what we do with our emergency services, which we both John wants to pose a question. Yeah, so I mean, the Department of Public Safety, I think, held a, yeah. a very large conference about dispatch and the new vision for dispatch, um, which is basically a fee for service model. Um, you know, it'd be great to hear a reaction from any of you uh, about that proposal. We just had uh, 
the commissioner in yesterday to talk about his modernization plan for the Department of Public Safety, one of which issues is dispatch. So it'd be great to get input from you. I know my time's already chiming into me, it's only their concerns, but. Um, so again, my name is Jesse Baker. I'm the city manager for the city of Winnipeg, and I'm also on the board of directors for the Chittenden County Public Safety Authority, which is a new union municipal district that was stood up um, by our regional population centers to combine dispatch services, to regionalize our dispatch services. Uh, the board and, and uh, um, my colleague Rick McGuire from Williston is also on that board with me as well. Um, that board is hard at work um, looking into how we do this in our Court Chittenden County communities. Um, the real challenge we are finding is with any innovation like this, um, to stand up a new model that we believe will be a much improved service delivery model over time for our residents, get public safety intervention to those who need it more quickly, um, and will also be more cost effective. It takes new dollars to become, new, to become more cost effective. So in the interest of standing up a new center, we need to uh, change radio systems, we need to modernize technology, we need a new server. With a regional dispatch solution like this, you can't just flip one switch off and flip another switch on. You need some period of time where you're running parallel systems. I think the challenge that we face in Vermont is our communities are paying for that service or not paying for it very, very differently. So in Winooski, the property taxpayers are paying for local dispatch as well as a PSAP through state property taxes uh, or state taxes. Uh, in other communities in Chittenden County, they are solely paying for that service through their state taxes, not on the local level. So you're seeing a need to increase the local level. Some kind of parity needs to be found across your community, so I think a fee for service is a great solution. And it, again, if you really want to encourage innovation and encourage uh, municipalities to come together for a regional um, approach, I know historically there were some uh, public safety equipment grants that were given out, and the, that funding has ebbed and flowed over time. Um, looking at some small capital grant dollars to encourage that initial capital investment, which is the one-time hurdle that is sometimes hard for communities to get to that future innovation, would be very welcome. Thank you. Well, that's a great idea. I mean, that, we didn't hear that yesterday, and that was one of the things I think was missing from the testimony here. Because I, I do think if you're switching the model, there are going to be costs when going to the regional model that you've all brought to. And I mean, I think, you know, if that's where we're headed, then we need to think about how to incentivize that. Right. Thank you, Professor. So we, last, you know, two years ago, or I don't know how many years ago, our, our committee did a, we're concerned about law enforcement and, and the same kind of issues around law enforcement that some cities are, some places are paying through their local taxes and then some people are just relying on the state police to cover them. And um, so we did a tour, and one, of, I'm not going to go into all of it, but one of the things that came out of that very clearly from every law enforcement person that we saw in, in most municipal people <coughs> was that if all law enforcement could be in the same retirement system in the state, which is the way they do it in New Hampshire, that you wouldn't have the problem where you have um, the town of Bellows Falls trains, sends somebody to the academy and gets them all trained up and everything, and then their retirement system isn't as good as the state police, so they they jump to the state police. So, is there have any of you talked about that at all, and about how it would impact your local community if if every law enforcement certified law enforcement officer was in the same state retirement system? I. Yeah, Eric Osgood, County Johnson. Uh, we contract with the Wild Sheriff's Department, and uh, that's exactly the problem we see because the, the sheriff's deputies are not allowed to be in the uh, state retirement system. Uh, we fork over the money, train them to, uh, or send them down for the training, give them a little bit of OJT on the road training, and then they jump to the municipality or state police. Uh, it's a cost that we're continually paying for is, is the training up of all these uh, officers. Uh, the other thing I would just say as far as the PSAP, uh, Lamoille County has had its own county PSAP for oh, 
know, we're coming on 40 or 50 years now. Uh, we were the first one in the state. Uh, it's a, it is a pay-as-you-go. We all contribute to it. It's a, uh, a cradle-to-grave type of event. PSAP, they don't uh, just tone out the fire department, the police, and then they uh, disappear. They, they're with them the whole time until the end of the event, and it's a, a model that uh, worked really well for us, and, and uh, it's something beyond what the normal PSAP for a lot. So we wouldn't train it. But yes, as far as uh, paying for the officers that go to other communities or, or the state police because of the retirement, we're dealing with that exact problem right now. We do have a bill specifically around sheriffs, but... Yes, I think we're under help. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Jesse Baker again. I promise this will be my last comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, so when you see we are not experiencing that problem, we certainly are um, sharing officers with our other Chittenden County communities, but they are all currently in the same retirement system. But for Burlington, everyone is in Beamers, which is the Vermont Municipal mm -hmm. Employees Retirement System. So I, we have not experienced that problem. I would like, on that topic, though, of um, re retention of excellent officers and actually recruitment of officers, the challenge we are seeing in when you see this is maybe specific to us is a real systematic challenge with the academy. Um, right now, the police academy is an overnight residential academy that is, um, I would argue, is historic and militaristic in its training. In Winooski, we have a real policy priority led by our city council to diversify our workforce and ensure that our officers are, reflect our community in Winooski. Um, that is very hard. To, if you really want to lower that barrier to entry to more diverse candidates in public safety, it's hard to do through a residential academy. These are folks who may be caring for young children, caring for multiple generations, being the sole interpreter in their family. For them to step out of their families for 12 or 14 weeks is a huge barrier to entry. If there was a non-residential academy that allowed them to get the training that, was, that is critical to them being able to carry out the mission, but allowed them to go home at nights and on the weekends and take care of their families, I think we would start to see the landscape of, of policing in Vermont look very different. We've been having this fight for many years, and um, we have been, we proposed uh, looking at alternative models, and we will keep pushing to look at alternative models, and just for your information, it is now 16 residential weeks. There is a proposal from the academy to make it 20. So, um, but we, it is something that we um, constantly bring up, and, um, and hopefully we'll have some aspect of that in the bill we're yeah. working on that. Thank you. Oh. I just want to make a comment um, and follow up with, with just shared. I see this as an equity issue. And I think if we look at it through that lens, maybe we'll get some traction and, and make some changes so that we can increase our participation in public safety. Well, we, we've talked about this uh, making it into a health issue as well. Mm -hmm. There's a community health. We brought the conversation that way. Mm -hmm. so better discuss sort of the needs, you know, what we should be doing around public safety. The other thing we're looking at, um, just that we're doing uh, um, some work on is the, our EMS systems are in, I don't know if in your communities they're in bad shape or not, but we're losing um, first responders and um, our EMS systems are overtaxed and so we're, we have a bill that we will actually be reviewing tomorrow, I believe, that we'll try to address some of those issues. And speaking of the academy, one of the problems that we have with EMS is that we have a fire academy and a police academy. We have nothing for EMS people. And in fact, if you want to be um, an EMT, the, if you take that program in Vermont, it costs $24,000. If you're lucky enough to live in Broward Road, and you can take it in Greenfield at seven. But so we're looking at how how we can beef up those that system. 
Because that's, that affects all of your <coughs> So Lucas Herring, Mayor of City of Barrie, not directly with the, um, the police service, but um, there are different positions that by default, if you have nowhere else to go, it is put on the police officer. So we had grants through Department of Corrections at one point for community outreach specialists. Those grants dried up. So that was something that was then born on our municipality. This year, there's actually a bill uh, for a mental health specialist. So we're looking to partner with Montpelier. We have the money in our budget, they do in theirs, uh, hoping that that can come together. Um, but it's really that um, the officers, so going from that 18 to 20 weeks, some of it's the specified training that they need to have to deal with all of these issues. And if there can be other positions that can deal with those that are not law enforcement, one is that perception again of who's coming to help me. Um, but the other one is, is the right services being provided by the right professional to do that in the community. And there are regional trainings that could happen around specialized training. I just, uh, anecdotally, I can support um, more of it along the lines of a rescue situation where you're dealing with it. I'm an individual that was suffering a heart attack. I have 911 system work perfectly in Vermont, um, but they dispatched somebody. They didn't have enough staff. This is up in Grand Isle, so they didn't show up. So they dispatched Plattsburgh, New York. They started across the ferry. Finally, Grand Isle showed up, so they canceled Plattsburgh. The guys on Grand Isle didn't have the proper staff that they needed, which is the person to put a port in. Nobody's an EMT. They're all volunteers. They re-dispatched Plattsburgh. Um, uh, then, um, and then what they decided to do was to throw me into the um, South Carolina rescue. Um, my wife basically said, should I go in the ambulance or not? And they said, that's okay, we're just going down to the Grand Isle Fire Department because we have to wait for someone from North Bureau's department to come down and put the port in. They drove me down in the ambulance one and a quarter miles away from my house to the fire station. We sat in the parking lot, waited for the individual to get off of his boat from fishing on Lake Champlain to come down uh, to meet so they could put a port in for an IV. Then they started into Burlington um, and uh, finally got to Burlington uh, for Fletcher Island. What normally takes me in a regular car driving normally, you can get from my house to park in Burlington in 30 minutes. Um, took an hour and 20 minutes. Um, I'm still here today, which is good, but there was, there, the, the, the point I'm getting at is that Colchester and Milton have EMTs full time on call all the time as part of their service. There should have been a normal reaction to do an intermediary call to say, we're gonna throw the guy in the wagon, we're gonna drive down to Sandbar State Park or whatever, meet us there so they can switch me up or throw the EMT in there. But that to me is a classic example of well-intentioned folks that don't have, something didn't click at that point. Um, you know, and it was a Sunday, they didn't have all the staff and that sort of stuff. So sort of, for me, it was just the perfect world. The summary of the whole story is that the South Hero one couldn't make it fast enough up as well because Willie, the donkey, was loose from the barn from Sheriff Allen's and he had to let Willie to go back in the barn before they could get the ambulance up to my house. Um, Willie just passed away this past weekend. But, uh, so the joke in the hospital was that an ass was more important than me that day. <laughs> but that, anyway, sorry for that, but just to, I would support that kind of stuff. In my estimate, to go beyond that, I think there's a level of regionalization that can occur in those services. Instead of having three volunteer yeah. rescue services right. in the islands, you have one rescue service. Everybody, you fill up your time sheet uh, areas and all that, and some of those folks can be EMTs to deal with the situation. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and uh, uh, the support for that through uh, additional training would be helpful. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. I'm, I'm glad you're here too. Yes. I'm just curious, in, in our area, you would have been airlifted. Is there not that service there? Uh, if there was, it was not. I mean, there is connectivity between, I mean, the Medical Center Hospital of Vermont, I'm, I'm an old guy, so I still want to call it Fletcher Allen, Mary Fletcher, and all that. But whatever that hospital is, they're now having, you know, they have a better affiliation with the class. 
Oxford, so they may have been able to do something, but I still, but I think what it was was just a comedy of errors, um, and just not doing the simple thing of saying we need to get this guy in an ambulance, start toward the hospital, and call one of the other folks that had the EMTs in them and do that intervention, not the intervention on drama and flight on the word. Her is, you know, I should know this having that have been working on the CMS call, but isn't there mutual aid that goes into, checks in at that moment? One would think so. That's just, I don't know. It's a, it's a real amazing story, and, um, uh, the, and, and the heart attack that I had was the Widowmaker version, so um, really, really amazing that I'm here, but, um, the, and the ER staff was amazed that there wasn't something else that occurred. And I'm not the individual that wants to go out and sue and all that sort of stuff because I have 30% scarring on my left ventricle and all that to this day. But um, it really, what I want to do at some point is to basically walk into their rescue during one of their trainings and say, hey, this is what happened. This should not happen again. Right. Well, I think we made some. It didn't, wouldn't solve that problem, but there, the, um, and I'm trying to remember exactly the emergency. There is a board of, of um, emergency medical people, and the board did not have the, the what we consider the appropriate re, uh, representation from from the different regions. It was uh, they were expected to represent huge regions, and we. We all changed that last two years ago. I think it was was it two years ago? I think to change the makeup of the board. So now there's more more local input into that board. So that hopefully should help with that um, coordination. I, I don't know that it will, but um, we heard a lot from the the ambulance people and the first responders. Because yeah. I know I know they need one, but yeah. so there's no fault yeah. for planes out there. They also. If you didn't know it, your fire departments and your police departments don't pay um, gas and diesel tax. But all of your ambulance services, and they all do, they all pay um, for gas and diesel tax. Is that because they're 501c3s or something? It, it's not 501 No, no. no um, 501c3s pay gas tax. Um, but it's where we're looking at it, and Senator Mass is looking at it in, in his his bill to see how we can do that. And it'll depend on because they're private um, ambulance companies too, and they get the same. I, I don't know. They're also private ambulance companies that apparently are now um, setting up to just do hospital to hospital transports because they can make money on that but not deal with people like you, but just hospital to hospital. And so we're trying to figure out how to have some regulation over them. Maybe require them to have a certificate of need the way hospitals do. I don't know. Anyway. The clerk of the year. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.